Well, amen, good morning. What an incredible morning of worship. Amen, right? I mean, do you trust the Lord? Do you trust God in good seasons and bad seasons that he is faithful, that he is causing all things to work together for our good? Amen, we're gonna see that in our text today, that God is working all things for our good and according to his plan. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter eight. If you don't have a Bible this morning, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. Make it your own. Highlight in it, mark it up. Okay, we've been, we've been walking through, uh, beginning last fall, the book of Acts. We've just been going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we, we've come to, uh, with, with Chad's sermon last week, we've come to the end of, of kind of a major section, major movement of what's happening in the book of Acts, okay? And so I want to pause, I want to highlight that to you, because I want you and I to notice God's gracious and patient offer of the gospel to Jerusalem, and especially to the leaders, right? The the apostles are being beaten, imprisoned, threatened, and angels are breaking them out of prison and saying, go right back to the temple courtyard and keep proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. You see, their witness of Jesus in the temple courtyard is paramount. Okay, we we are eight months to maybe two or three years after uh, the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus, okay? That sort of time frame. But think about from a biblical perspective how important this is because the temple was, that's where God's presence was. Okay? where the festivals, where the sacrifice, all of that was supposed to be there, but then Jesus shows up as the new temple. Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. And then the Spirit falls, and now his presence is in his people. And so at, at the beginning of Acts, he, he allows for, for Peter and John to just be able to perform a miracle right there in the temple courtyard. And then later when they're arrested, uh, the the angels come and take all the apostles out of jail, go right back to the temple, all of this. And then last week, we saw Stephen again in the temple courtyard as the last dynamic witness. And he is much like Jesus with signs and wonders with confounding teaching, God even allowed his face to shine like an angel. He even prayed as they were killing them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Consider the patient, gracious offer of the gospel to Jerusalem. And many have responded. Okay, it's hard for us to know exactly um, but the early, it might be one in five. It's possible as high as one in three in Jerusalem. But as a whole, and especially the leadership, they have rejected. And from here, we will see, because of the, the martyrdom of Stephen, a massive persecution breaks out, but it's all according to God's plan because the gospel will go out. Remember Acts 1.8, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. So listen as I read the first eight verses of chapter eight of the book of Acts. (coughs) Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and, be and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. And so there was much rejoicing in that city. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to your word, as you continue to teach us and allow us to, to see and to understand uh, what you have done for your church and who we are, the, the work that you want us to continue, Father, we pray this morning, right now, that you would do whatever it takes in order for us as a church and as individuals to have a fire lit for evangelism, to shine the light of Jesus to those around us. We see how you do that here so that the gospel goes out. Father, we want to be a part. We do not want to be passed over, but we want you to use us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I don't know about you, I, I am a person of routine, okay? I drive the same routine, I walk the same routines on campus, I sit in the same spot, okay? I eat one thing at every restaurant I go to. You ask me, do you wanna go to that restaurant? And I think of the one thing I order off that menu and I'm like, ah, do I want that right now? It never occurs to me that they serve other things there, okay? Now, I'm betting I'm not alone in this, okay? Human nature, in many aspects, despises change. Change brings uncertainty and the possibility of loss. I remember moving here. Uh, whenever you have that much change, everything speeds up. Okay, you go through the day trying to process names and new systems and new culture and hoping I'm not inadvertently stepping on someone's toes. I couldn't wait for things to slow down, to just feel normal again, for it to feel like home and to get into my routines. In Jerusalem, after Jesus' death and resurrection, much has changed, right? God's presence is in his people. Everything we've been highlighting, right? All fall. But at the same time, if we're honest, so much is still the same. Same homes and familiar streets and businesses. And, and even the, the good news of seeing friends and loved ones get saved. See, the gospel as a metaphor is trapped inside the bubble of Jerusalem. Jesus has said, you will be my witnesses in Samaria and all of Judea, even the ends of the earth. Well, well, maybe that means that the ends of the earth are going to come to Jerusalem, right? A, a light on a hill. But Stephen's death bursts that bubble. It ignites an intense persecution all throughout Jerusalem. Okay, they are going house to house, dragging people out, putting them on trial. This causes so many of that early church, those first Christians, to flee in a panic. They are forced outside of their comfort zone. But here's the deal. Even though it didn't feel like it, it didn't seem like it at the time, God was in control. 
accomplishing his plans. And as the gospel will now begin to spread like pollen in the wind. Philip, one of the seven deacons that was chosen okay, to oversee the food distribution ministry, he has been dispersed to Samaria. And Philip's world has been turned upside down. You know, he worked right alongside Stephen. They learned together, prayed together, served together. He, uh, Philip was probably one of the godly men that buried Stephen. And then looked into his wife's eyes and children's eyes and grieved with them. Philip likely has his own wife and his own children. And in a panic, they have left everything familiar, fleeing to Samaria. Only later will they be able to look back and see God's hand through it all. Philip finds himself in the capital city of Samaria. Okay, the former capital of the northern kingdom. Now, the history of Samaria is going to be uh, really important for us understanding our context today. I know you heard from Daniel just a couple weeks ago, right? How the Jews hated Samaritans, right? Every time you walk through uh, John 4 and the woman at the well, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They would not step foot in Samaria. They would walk around, if at all possible. But I want to give us just a little more context so that you understand how recent that hatred was. If you go all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 12, that's when the 10 northern tribes, Israel used to be all one nation, but the 10 northern tribes rebel and break off uh, from the two southern tribes, okay? And they form the northern kingdom. <clears throat> now that kingdom comes to an end in 2 Kings chapter 17, when the Assyrians come down and defeat and then carry off into exile as slaves as much of the population as they could. In the ancient world, whenever you wanted to defeat your foe, you had a couple options here, and one of those was to, was to take off as slaves as many people as they could. You would, you would absolutely break the back of that people. Then the Assyrians settle into the land. They vacate as many, and then they come and settle into the land. They force breeding with anyone left, replacing the Israelites in every town. Now, once the Assyrians have settled in the land, and 2 Kings 17 tells us that lions began ravaging and devouring the land. So much so... <clears throat> that the Assyrians said, the gods of this land are upset at us. And they sent word back to the king, and the king sent one priest, doesn't even tell us who, to come back and to teach them to fear the Lord. But that section ends with they so they worship the Lord, but they also serve their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations which they had come. All right, this is called syncretism, right? Let's just mix religions together. So fast forward a little in time, and the Samaritans have built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. Some of what they're doing looks like what the Jews did but some of it not. At one point, in order to show their allegiance to the Greeks, they dedicate that temple to Zeus. All right, not exactly a high point in biblical faithfulness. In 128 BC, during the Maccabean period, the Jews come and destroy that temple on Mount Gerizim. And then 20 years later, they come and they wipe out the capital city 
of Samaria. It's not until 27 BC that Herod the Great rebuilds the city that Philip now stands in. All right, so why do I tell you all of that? What does that mean? I mean, you got to understand, the Jews hate what the Assyrians have done. Samaritans are half-breeds, impure. They might have a few things right, but they are messing up a whole lot of things, a lot of things wrong. And as humans, we have a tendency to hate that which is most like us, but different. Because those dividing lines become very distinct. You see, the history here is messy. In fact, in in Luke 9, Jesus was passing through a village in Samaria, and it says that they would not receive him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. Okay, talk about divides. They wouldn't even hear him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. And at the end of that section, John and Peter say to Jesus, Jesus, should we call down fire to consume them right now? Jesus is like, no, I don't think you're getting the point. But that sort of hatred. Now, all of this makes the gospel movement that much more magnificent. Because instead of making those impure, wrong temple worshiping Samaritans come to Jerusalem, the gospel goes to them. Philip goes to them by the sovereign hand of God. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. You see, with all the theological and cultural differences, Philip went down there and he gave them a history lesson and he told them everything they were doing wrong. No, that's not what it says. Philip comes And he proclaims Christ. He offers Christ. And they believe. And there is much rejoicing. Crowds in unison. Luke wants us to see that the fire flame of the gospel has been ignited in Samaria. Think back with me. How many of those were from the village of the woman at the well in John 4, right, who had believed in Jesus years prior, probably heard of his death, but we're asking the question, what now? Well, now they know that Jesus' death and resurrection included them as an offer of faith for anyone who believes That Jesus, the holy son of God, has paid for your sins. Church, it's good for us to pause and to pray here right now. Right in the middle of the sermon. It's not over, right? Just to pause and to pray and to say, you know what, God? Would you take me out of my comfort zone so that the gospel would go forward? Let's pray, our Heavenly Father, just as we think about your word and as we apply your word, as we, as we see that, that there are times in our lives when, when our hand is forced, but it is your hand of goodness. And so we say we trust you, and Father, that we long to see the gospel go forward to our neighbors to our coworkers, to those that we love and and even those that we don't love. God, we want to be a part of something magnificent, your kingdom going forward. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now in verses 9 through 24, we are introduced to a specific individual. And Luke wants us to consider his faith. This is Simon the Magician. I will call him Superficial Simon. Simon is famous. 
He is very well known uh, for his magic arts. So the practice in magic in the ancient world was, was ever present, especially in a place like Samaria, right? Re remember the syncretism of Samaria? Well, well Simon's going to thrive here. Now, much of it was sleight of hand or shallow illusions, but it is certainly possible for someone as famous as Simon, Simon to be tapping into demonic power. Simon is rich, and he has much influence. He has been leading people to pridefully worship him as some sort of demigod, some sort of one who has special connections in the spiritual world. When Philip shows up preaching the gospel and God authenticates Philip's message with signs and wonders. See it right there? It says, it says paralyzed and lame people were healed. Right, the same power that, that Jesus healed or the apostles has been given to Philip and even to cast out those who are demon-possessed. Now, this certainly catches the eye of Simon. Here, for the first time, he is seeing real power, unlike any sleight-of-hand performances that he's done. Verse 13, it says, even Simon himself believed and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. As he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. All right, so here Luke tells us, all right, that even Simon believed and was baptized. But I'm going to tell you, Simon's belief was a superficial belief. I'm going to tell you plainly, he has not been saved. And rather, Simon is a warning of false faith. Luke takes special attention to unfold this one man's heart motives and to show us their end. You say, Pastor, how do you know he's not saved? All right, so look with me here. In verses 14 through 17, the apostles hear that the Samaritans have received the gospel, that they're believing in Jesus. And John and Peter come down from Jerusalem to Samaria to check it out. Now, the spirit had not yet fallen on anyone in Samaria. I got to pause here real quick, okay? Because this passage that we're dealing with today becomes a very important a uh, theological question gets raised that the charismatics call the second baptism of the Spirit, okay? I'm going to deal with that exclusively next week, okay? All of next week is going to be an excursus, that's an aside, on does this uh, section of Scripture teach the second baptism of the Spirit? For today, I just wanted to walk through the narrative, okay? So if that interests you, come next week, all right? Hopefully it does. All right, so back to the question of how do we know that Simon has not been saved? All right, so Peter and John come down from Jerusalem. They are laying their hands on all the new believers, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. But notice in 17 and 18, guys, Simon is an onlooker. He's an outsider. He didn't receive the Holy Spirit and start praising God. Instead, he sees what's happening from the perspective of, wow. Look at this power when Peter and John are praying over someone. I need that sort of power. Just think of the influence and the money that I could make here. And in verses 18 and 19, Simon offers them money. 
Give me this authority as well. And so in verse 20, Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. In Greek, Peter's words are much harsher. He's saying, to hell with you and your money. Verse 21, for you have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. You see, even though Simon has believed in some way enough to to fool Philip and to get baptized, he does not have saving faith. Why? Why? Because he's not surrendered to the king and to his kingdom. He's thinking, wow, I've never seen anything like this. This is fun. Gosh, this could be so advantageous for me. He's never in his own heart of hearts convicted about his own sin. He never says, I need to be born again. I need to repent and to surrender to the power and to the authority of the real king. Do you remember in John 6? In John 6, after a full day of teaching, Jesus fed 5,000 men, it says. I mean, I mean, imagine how large the crowd is, 10, 12,000. And the next day, that crowd has found him. Jesus left and went on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and they found him. Multitudes come and find him and Jesus looks at him and says, you're here for the wrong reasons. You're here for food. And Jesus begins to press them. He begins to teach them that what he is offering is only available with complete dependence, that you must surrender, that he is the king. He is so much the king that you must eat his flesh and drink his blood. That's the sort of dependence and absolute surrender that is necessary for anyone who comes to him. And after saying this, okay, thousands leave because his words are too harsh. You mean complete surrender, total dependence, multitudes leave so much so that Jesus turns to the 12 and says, are you going to? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 6, 68. So here, in the middle of a revival in Samaria, Luke takes the time and space, right? Multitudes are coming to faith. This is exciting stuff. Can you believe it? The gospel has gone to the Samaritans. The spirit has fallen upon the Samaritans. And Luke takes the time to carve out an aside of a man that from the worldly perspective, he would be great to have on our team, right? He's got money, he's got influence. Wouldn't his story be awesome? Once he saw real power, but instead, he's a warning that saving faith is more than accepting Jesus as facts. Saving faith means to trust, to rely upon, to put all your hope in. And only those who come under the authority of King Jesus can be saved. And these terms are not negotiable. In fact, Jesus says himself in Matthew 7, that many will say to him on that final day, Lord, did we not do marvelous works in your name? 
Jesus, I went to church. I prayed over my food. I thanked you for my job. And Jesus will reply, depart from me. I never knew you. See, seeking the things of God and the blessings of God are not the same as seeking God himself. And yet, look at the way that this narrative ends. Because Peter, with full bluntness, right? He's not holding anything back. He calls Simon to repent. Even offers him the chance. Verse 22 and 23. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray And pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. You see the phrase, if possible here, it's not a good English phrase. Because in our minds, it kind of signals pretty low probability, right? Maybe, but but probably not. However, the, the Greek is actually much more positive here. Paul uses it in Acts 17, 20, uh, 27 to the Athenians that if perhaps that they might grope for him, that they would find him because he is not far from each of us, right? So, so Peter's saying to Simon, Simon, check your heart, man. Repent and be saved from your sin for God is near, He's near. So how marvelous is the scene? Because you got to remember, Simon is a deceiver. He spent, he spent the majority of his life leading people astray spiritually. Having them worship him, be interested. He's not pointing them to God. And yet... Here in this scene, Simon the deceiver, who is, I would assume, a Samaritan. Okay, so now you add all of that context on. He is right here, and the gospel has come to him. And marvelous sign, and word, and deed. He's even having a personal conversation with the apostle Peter who's telling him, repent, God is near, repent right now, check your heart, man. But you have to face the bondage of your sin. Right? The bitterness of your heart. The offer is not to add Jesus' kingdom upon yours. To see the advantageous nature of what would it mean if you added Jesus. The offer is to die to your kingdom and to come underneath Jesus. Listen to Jesus' own words in Matthew 16. For, who, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Now, sadly, Simon answers again with confusion. And then the narration just ends. Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourself so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Sorry, Simon, that's not how it works, man. No one can pray for you. No one can repent for you. No one can stand in your place. Only you can do business with God. Right, Your grandmother, your, your father, your sister, not even the apostle Peter can do business for you. Only you can, by faith, bow your knee before King Jesus and be saved. 
And then the narration just ends. And, and we don't know what hap- how he responds after that. Church history d- doesn't record very good of him. Just kind of leaves a helpless taste in your mouth. So hypothesize with me that Simon does not come to saving faith and then stands before God on judgment day, knowing that he was so close to the kingdom of God and yet so far away. What does he say to God? But but I saw the power of God. I saw the lame and the paralyzed healed. Devils rebuked. I saw the Holy Spirit fall on Samaritans. I know Peter. Check with him. He he would vouch for me. Simon, you stand condemned in your own sin because you were never willing to come before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and in your sin, bow your knee and say, I need you as a savior. And Christ will say to him, depart from me. I never knew you. What a question for us to ask this morning. Do you know him? Do you know him? Right? Not not are you around all the, the spiritual things. Do you know him? And to know him means that you have stood bare before him, acknowledged your sin, and found that he offers grace on the other side. That's what it means to know him. I have found grace on the other side, friend. I found grace on the other side. Oh, that you, we wouldn't just go through the motions and pretend and play. I found grace on the other side. So would you pray with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you were here this morning and you are unsure if you have ever settled, if you've ever done business, if you know him, if you are saved, would you cry out to him right now in the name of Jesus? confessing your sin, acknowledging you have no standing before a holy God in and of yourself, but you are in desperate need of a Savior. His name is King Jesus. And if you will surrender to him right now, he offers you eternal life because to know him is to have eternal life. And if you are here this morning and you are a believer Are you adding Jesus' kingdom onto your own? We do that, don't we? We we so easily get caught up in our own plans and our own ideas and, and just a word of surrender is such a good reminder to all of us, our Heavenly Father. We surrender to you. We surrender. You are king. You are on your throne. As scary as it is with this text, we pray, Father, that you would have your way in us. Use us. Teach us. Grow us. Because you are good and you are kind. Remove our plans and reveal your plans. Please, King Jesus. Because to know you and to follow you is life. And that is what we want. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond.
Okay, if you have heard God's word, you are commanded to respond. I can never tell you what that looks like. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. Okay, if you wanna use these steps or the stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord, I encourage you to be responsive, okay? You've sat and you've listened, you've taken notes. Now be responsive in song, in prayer, act unto the Lord. If you need to talk to someone about receiving Jesus and what that means, please come. Whatever decision God has laid upon your heart, be obedient.